Welcome to Lesson 14b, Boundary Layer Flow Separation. In this lesson, we define the flow separation point in a boundary layer. Then we'll discuss the progression leading up to separation and even beyond. To define flow separation, first consider a boundary layer with an adverse pressure gradient. From the previous lesson, we plotted u, the x component of velocity, and omega z as functions of y. When there's an adverse pressure gradient, we see a profile that looks something like this with an inflection point, and a vorticity profile that looks something like this with this point corresponding to the inflection point. As the adverse pressure gradient gets stronger, two things happen. The slope at the wall of the velocity profile gets smaller. This is the slope here, but it will work its way towards a smaller value. And note that we're plotting u on the horizontal axis, so a smaller slope is more vertical on this plot. Also, omega z at y equals 0 moves towards 0. In other words, this point starts moving towards the origin on this plot. As dp dx keeps increasing, it gets large enough that the slope of the velocity profile is 0, and omega z at the origin goes to 0. The velocity profile will look something like this, where the slope right at the wall is actually zero. And the corresponding vorticity plot has zero vorticity at the wall, and then asymptotes to zero. There's still an inflection point. So continuing our sentence here, if this happens, we call this the separation point, where del u del y at the wall is zero, zero slope, and omega z at the wall is zero. Note also that since tau w is mu del u del y at the wall, tau w is also zero, whereas we have a small value of tau w for this adverse pressure gradient case. At flow separation, there is no shear stress. Note also that omega z is still negative everywhere, but it's now zero at the wall. There's still a slope of omega z, so positive vorticity is still being produced at the wall, as we discussed in the previous lesson. When this happens, we say that there is boundary layer separation, where the boundary layer lifts up off of the wall. Let's look at the progression of flow separation, where we consider a wall like this, with flow from left to right as usual. In this region of the flow, we'll have a favorable pressure gradient with a large slope at the wall and a large tau w. This is favorable because u is increasing and pressure is decreasing. Somewhere near the top, we have a zero pressure gradient case with a smaller slope and a smaller tau w. Again, this is approximately the zero pressure gradient case. But as we continue to move along into this back end of the body, we now encounter a region where u is decreasing and pressure is increasing. In other words, an adverse pressure gradient. The boundary layer profile will look something like this with an inflection point. And notice that there's a smaller capital U outside the boundary layer. As we continue to move downstream, the slope is even smaller than before when we have a very small tau w. As we continue to move along this wall, we'll reach the separation point where there's zero slope at the wall, as I sketch here, and tau w is zero. There's still an inflection point, but this will be the separation point where tau w is zero. If you take a streamline just above the wall, like this, it actually separates from the wall, and there has to be backflow to fill in that gap. Streamlines above it will have to veer away from the wall like that, and the edge of the boundary layer veers up as well. This boundary layer tends to be a lot thicker than this one. We can sketch the velocity profile in this region. I'll remove this streamline so we don't complicate our figure. But the profile will have a backflow region where the flow actually goes backwards. And since the slope is now in the opposite direction, tau w is actually negative as well. So we see a region of reverse flow. But sir, when tau w is backwards like that, isn't that good? Isn't it like negative drag? Well, BJ, that's true for skin friction drag. When the flow separates, pressure drag goes way up, and that overwhelms any small negative drag you gain from the skin friction. In fact, let's look at the consequences. First of all, the boundary layer equations are not valid beyond the separation point. Why not? Recall that the boundary layer equations were parabolic, 
where we had to have information upstream and then we march downstream. We did not specify the downstream boundary conditions, just the wall, the outer flow, and some inlet area. But when you have reverse flow, you have flow coming in from the back or from the outlet, and thus the parabolic nature of the boundary layer equations is destroyed. Number two, delta gets very large, so the boundary layer is no longer thin, again causing the boundary layer equations to break down. Mathematically, the del squared u del x squared term in the x momentum boundary layer equation is no longer negligible. The boundary layer equations are not valid. Perhaps even worse is that the irrotational outer flow solution recall from step one of our boundary layer procedure is no longer valid. This is critical because the P of X that we use to generate our boundary layer solution is no longer valid. In our example, the outer flow would just keep going along the wall here. But when you have flow separation, the streamlines veer off and the whole pressure field and velocity field in this region changes from what it was when we predicted the irrotational outer flow without separation. The bottom line is that beyond flow separation, the full Navier-Stokes equations, which are mathematically elliptic, are required. This is because we're now transferring information in both directions, downstream and upstream, hence the elliptic nature of the problem. When I was an undergraduate, I ran lots of boundary layer codes, and CFD was just coming of age, and we would run the boundary layer code up to the separation point, and then we'd have to stop. Now you just solve the whole thing using the Navier-Stokes equation with a CFD code. Thank you, sir. Does that have anything to do with why golf balls have dimples? Good question, BJ. They are kind of related. If we have a golf ball without dimples, at typical Reynolds numbers for a golf ball, the flow separates near the top. The boundary layer here is laminar, and a laminar boundary layer is not very resistant to flow separation. If we have the same smooth golf ball, but at a higher Reynolds number where the flow is turbulent, turbulent boundary layer is much more resistant to flow separation, so the separation occurs later, further downstream on the wall. And since pressure drag dominates these kinds of flows, the drag goes way down. Well, golf balls aren't typically hit fast enough to make this boundary layer turbulent. So what they do at this lower Reynolds number is put roughness, namely dimples, all over the ball, and even at the same Reynolds number, the boundary layer is laminar for a while, but then trips to turbulent, forcing the separation to occur later, and thus decreasing the drag. The bottom line is this. We have more surface or skin friction drag on this case than on this case. But because of the delayed flow separation, we have much lower pressure drag, and the overall drag actually ends up being smaller. So dimpled golf balls can be hit farther than non-dimpled smooth golf balls. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.